Welcome, welcome. So good to see you tonight. Your smiling faces, what a blessing. So good to be with you guys. Excited to get back in the book of Jeremiah. So if you have your Bibles, let's open them up to Jeremiah chapter 49. As we continue on in our journey, I don't want to say how far we'll get tonight. We'll see. There's a lot of stuff going on. It's going to be really just a lot of um, uh, continued judgment. Uh, and we'll give that, I'll give more information. Let's pray first and we'll talk about what we have in store for tonight. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. And Lord, no matter where we are in your word, it is your word. And it's alive and breathing, God, and, and it's powerful. And you're going to be speaking to us tonight what you want to say. God, you've given every bit of your word for a purpose. Every field we graze in, every area, Lord, that we feed on from your word as your sheep, uh, it is for our nourishment spiritually. It is to grow us. And so, Lord, have your way tonight. Fill us and grow us. And, Lord, make yourself known through your word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, remember, Jeremiah was called as not just a prophet to Israel. Jeremiah was called a prophet to the nations. So we've been seeing Jeremiah speak of the judgment of the nation of Israel all through here because that's where the nation was. They were being judged by God, being warned about the coming judgment. And then the judgment came with Babylon coming in and wiping them out. Now we shift it over to where he's speaking of the judgment of the nations. So remember, it's the, you know, the Lord says, not just Israel you're going to be a, a, a prophet for. You're going to be a prophet to the nations. Now we're seeing the nations, and we take up tonight with Ammon. Remember, uh, Ammon, A-M-E, the bad spelling of Amy, as we said. Uh, if you're looking at Israel, a map in your mind, and you go opposite of the Mediterranean, up Israel's M, and the bottom is E, Ammon, Moab, and Edom. And that way, when you hear these judgments, you can picture geographically where these areas are. So we're at Ammon, which is the top of Israel, but further in from the Mediterranean. Against the Ammonites, verse 1, chapter 49, thus says the Lord, has Israel no sons? Has he no heir? Why then does Malcolm inherit Gad and his people dwell in their cities? Now, what in the world's going on? Mil uh, Milcom was one of their gods, and Gad was the region on the other side of the Jordan up there near the Sea of Galilee. So if you got to the Sea of Galilee and came down a little bit toward, you know, the, the southern part of Israel, on the other side, which is where uh, modern-day Jordan is today, that region right over there was called Gad, the side that's closest to Israel, and it was given to the Gadites, one of the tribes of Israel. And oftentimes, it would go back and forth as to who controlled it. Uh, the Ammonites, the Moabites, they'd come in and conquer those in Gad, kick them out. Then, they, then Israel would repent. God would give the area of Gad back to them. And so what God is saying is it's been taken over now by Ammon. Ammon's come in and taken over the Gadites' property, the Gadites' territory. Uh, they're right next to the Jordan on the other side, modern-day Jordan, if you will, next to the Jordan River, but modern-day Jordan uh, as far as the country now. And, and he's saying, look, well, how come the children of Israel aren't there? He's kind of speaking this, kind of looking, why aren't you there? Why is the God of, of the Ammonites in, in my land? And, and why is Milcom? Should be Jehovah, not Milcom. And Gad should be there, not the Ammonites. So he's going, what's going on? Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will cause to be heard an alarm of war in Rabbah of the Ammonites. It shall be a desolate mound, and her villages shall be burned with fire. Then Israel shall take possession of his inheritance, says the Lord. So God says, I'm going to judge you for taking Israel's land. I'm going to push you back out and give it back to Israel. Yes, I'm judging my kids, but I'm going to judge you now because you spilled over your boundaries. And I gave that land to Israel. He says, well, O Heshbon, for Ai is plundered. Cry, you daughters of Rabbah, gird yourselves with sackcloth, lament, run to and fro by the walls, for Milcom shall go into captivity with his priest and his princes bring fear upon you, says the Lord of hosts, that's the Lord of battle. From all those who, go ar uh, who are around you, you shall be driven out, everyone headlong, and no one will gather those who wander off. But afterward, I will bring back the captives of the people of Ammon, says the Lord. So I'm going to judge you. But after I chastise you, I'm going to bring the people of Ammon back. And again, we see today the, the uh, uh, region of Ammon is uh, re-inhabited with the modern-day Jordan. Uh, matter of fact, uh, Ammon, uh, which is another way to say Ammon. Ammon is their, uh, their capital today. So God has been faithful, as always, to his word. Now he goes on to Edom. So you have uh, uh, Ammon up top. You go down to Moab. And now we're jumping all the way to the bottom, Edom. And remember, Edom are the descendants of Esau. Okay, Jacob and Esau, Jacob's brother, uh, one God gave the blessing through Jacob. Esau was fleshly and wanted the world and, and again sold his birthright, being the older brother for some, some soup that Jacob was making. And again, the consequence of that, big red, you know, he was called, he came out all red and hairy, uh, you know, and, and so and he was known, that's what Edom means, is red. So now the judgment against Edom or Esau's descendants, thus says the Lord, is wisdom no more in Teman? These are all areas there obviously in Edom. 
Has counsel perished from the prudent? Has their wisdom vanished? Flee, turn back, dwell in the depths, O inhabitants of Dedan, for I will bring the calamity of Esau upon him, the time that I will punish him. If grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave some gleaning grapes? You know, when you clear the grapes out, you leave a few on the vine. If thieves by night, would, would they not destroy until they had enough? In other words, someone breaks in your house, they don't take everything, right? It's not like the Grinch, you know, takes even the last hoo hash. They're going to leave something, right? He says, but, but I have made Esau bare. So he's going to strip everything free from Esau. I've uncovered his secret places, and he shall not be able to hide himself. His descendants are plundered, his brethren and his neighbors, and he is no more. But notice what he says, really, God's mercy. Leave your fatherless children that is the orphans, I'll preserve them alive. And let your widows trust in me. Isn't that sweet? All through the word of God, listen, if you are an orphan or considered yourself an orphan or whatever your, your viewpoint of that is, and most people, again, have been either adopted or whatever the case might be, but if you were ever an orphan or a widow or a widower, really the widows is really the one that the Lord talks to here because widowers can pretty much take care of themselves generally. As, as a man in that day, they could work. The women really had, couldn't work as freely as men. But he said this, if you're a widow or, or orphan, God gives the command in his word, you're to be taken care of as a special care. You're supposed to watch after widows and orphans. And that's even today. He says, what pure religion is the care of widow and orphans? Um, and so there's a, why does God do that? Because the widow didn't have anybody to help her. Again, remember, uh, women didn't, they, they couldn't freely work like men did in that day. And even in our day, if a woman gets older and her husband dies, it's kind of hard to go back to work, you know, in your 70s or whatever the case might be and try to find work. It can be done, but it's hard. And God says, you should have compassion on the widows and take care of them. Orphans, God says, you know what? Uh, they don't have a dad. So the, the widow doesn't have a husband to help her. The, the, the orphans don't have a dad. So, you know, you be a dad to them. You love them. You take them in. So, and again, just as a reminder, if you come from that background, you hold a special place in God's heart. You may have grown up thinking, wow, you know, how come I had to be an orphan? How come I had this? You know, why is, why is you know, my husband has, has gone on and I'm the one that doesn't have, you know, whatever, a spouse or this kind of thing. And God says, no, in my sight, you're very special. I keep an eye special on you because I'm going to watch after you uh, more closely. As a matter of fact, the way that people treat you, God's going to hold them more accountable on the day of judgment. So recognize that God, God holds you in a special place and you're held in a special place in God's eyes. And even here when God's judging the nation, uh, Esau's descendants, Edom, he says, you know what, however, I'm going to take care of the fatherless, uh, the orphans and the widows. They can trust in me. For thus says the Lord, behold, those who ju whose judgment was not to drink of the cup have assuredly drunk. And you know, he, Esau wasn't supposed to be judged. He should have been in the blessed of the Lord, but he chose to rebel, in other words. And are you the one who will altogether go unpunished? No, but just because you're a descendant of, of, of Abraham, you know, you're still going to be punished. You shall not go unpunished, but you shall surely drink of it. For I've sworn by myself, says the Lord, that Basra, that's that area down there near Petra, Petra and Basra are close by, that Basra shall become a desolation, a reproach, a waste, and a curse. And all its cities shall be a perpetual waste. Now, again, it's pretty barren down there now, but it's really going to be wiped out when the Lord comes back and judges that region, uh, when he, he protects the Jews down there. We talked about that in the last days, and he's going to wipe it out. So this is, I think, kind of a dual prophecy relating to what happened then and maybe even some future judgment on that region when the Lord comes back in the second coming. He says, For I've heard a message from the Lord, and an ambassador has been sent to the nations. Gather together, come against her, and rise up to battle. So they're going to, the ambassadors of the nations are going to bring, come together to, to destroy Edom. For indeed, I will make you small among nations, despised among men. Your fierceness has deceived you. The pride of your heart, O oh, you who dwell in the clefts of the rock, who hold the height of the hill, though you make your nest as high as the eagle, I will bring you down from there, says the Lord. Again, we don't know for sure he's talking about Petra here, but they're known for their red rocks and the region of Petra, and they built a city in Petra, as you know, and it was a fortified city. It was almost inconquerable because you had to pass through uh, what they call the city made out of rock, and no one can get to us. And God says, you know what? I don't care how mighty you think you are. If you, because of your sin and lack of repentance to me, I'm going to judge you. And even as the majestic eagle, you know, sits high in the, in the nest there upon the rocks or whatever, and, and it, this kind of thing, I'm going to bring you down. Uh, you think you're secure like that, but you're not secure. I'm going to judge you and, uh, and all this. So again, he's just warning him. You, know, you, can't, you can't, no matter how strong you are, you can't get away from the judgment of God. He says, Edom also shall be an astonishment. Everyone who goes by it will be astonished and will hiss at all its plagues. It's like, what happened to them, you know? As in the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighbors, says the Lord. No one shall remain there, nor a son of man dwell in it. And again, it's a real barren area even today. 
Behold, he shall come up like a lion from the flood plain of the Jordan against the dwelling places of the strong. Again, now the thing about a lion from the flood plain of the Jordan is the, the idea is that the lions that are living near the Jordan there, when the flood plains would rise, the waters would push them further back. And now the lions are coming into areas they're not normally in. So if you're traveling down to the Jordan, you may suddenly have a lion jump out and surprise you. And back during the biblical days, they had lions there in the land. Now, there aren't lions there now. They killed them all out, but there were lions in the land in that day. And he's saying, it's going to be a surprise. It's going to be this sudden you know, change of judgment that you weren't expecting, even like a lion being forced away from the, you know, the banks of the water because it's rising and suddenly they're upon you. Now, the dwelling place of the strong, he says, but I will suddenly make him run away from her. And who is a chosen man that I may appoint over her? Who's going to you know, basically watch over them for who's like me? You know, I, w- I would have watched over you, but you wouldn't let me. Who will arraign me? And who is that shepherd who will withstand me? You know, you're not going to be able to stop the judgment again. I'm the shepherd that's going to judge you because I'm the Lord. Therefore, hear the counsel of the Lord that he has taken against Edom, and his purpose is that he has purposed against the inhabitants of Teman. Surely the least of the flock shall draw them out. Surely he shall make their dwelling places desolate with them. The earth shakes at the noise of their fall, and the cry of its noise is heard at the Red Sea. So word's going to spread all the way down again. Uh, uh, you know, the sea is very near uh, uh, that region up there, so they're going to hear it all the way across that region. In other words, the judgment of Edom. Behold, he shall come up and fly like an eagle, and spread his wings over Basra. The heart of the mighty men of Edom in that day shall be like the heart of a woman in birth pain. So it's that picture of the, you know, the, the, the Lord judging and flying over from this vantage point you know, and bringing this judgment down on Basra. And again, like a woman in birth pain, self-explanatory. It's going to be a very fearful, painful moment, if you will, for them as a nation. Now he talks about the judgment of Damascus. This is up here in modern-day Syria. He says, against Damascus, Hamath and Arpad are shamed. For they've heard bad news, and they're faint-hearted. There's trouble on the sea. It cannot be quiet. Now, that's interesting to me because uh, Damascus is pretty far away from any sea, if you will. So, again, the, the, the army's coming in from the Mediterranean, traveling across the land to judge Damascus. There may be a dual prophecy here to the future judgment on Damascus from the, the, the uh, battleships that will be in the Mediterranean. When you read um, uh, Isaiah chapter 17, uh, verse 1, it talks about the fact that uh, Damascus will be destroyed. It'll become a pile of rubble, it says, and never again to be inhabited. That hasn't happened yet. And so that's still yet future. So this very possibly is a dual prophecy, maybe of some of the missiles coming in, some of the armament coming in from the battleships that'll be attacking Damascus out in the Mediterranean whenever that Isaiah 17, one judgment takes place in the last days. Uh, so maybe a dual thing going on here. It says it cannot be quiet. Damascus has grown feeble. She turns to flee and fear has seized her. Anguish and sorrows have taken her again like a woman in labor. The Lord uses that a lot. Why is the city of praise not deserted, the city of my joy? Now, it's interesting. He calls Damascus the city of praise and the city of his joy. And it has been historically throughout history, a lot of Christians being there off and on. It certainly is not today. But at the same time, it's interesting. God calls Damascus the city of praise and a city of his joy. By how things change, right? Um, and yet it, it was that situation. And the Lord's grieving the fact that it's turned from that. Therefore, a young men shall fall in her streets, and all the men of war shall be cut off in that day, says the Lord of hosts or battle. I will kindle a fire in the wall of Damascus, and it shall consume the places of Ben Hadad. Now, again, uh, Ben Hadad was kind of like a name that traveled on. It wasn't like an in- in- individual person, if you will. Ben Hadad was like we'd say president today or, or whoever the leader was. So it's going to, again, consume the palaces of the leadership of Syria. Now he goes to Kedar and Hazor. Hazor uh, or as they say in Israel, Hatzor. This is, uh, again, now in the upper part and the upper region there of Israel. Against Kedar and against the kingdoms of Hazor, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, shall strike. Thus says the Lord, Arise, go up to Kedar, and devastate the men of the east. The tents of the flocks they shall take away. They shall take for themselves their curtains, all their vessels, and their camels. And they shall cry out to them, Fear is on every side. Again, they're going to be surrounded by the Babylonians, and Babylon's going to come in and burn these areas down to the ground. Uh, again, in the excavations of Hazor, um, or I, again, they say Hatzor over there. That way, I only say that if you ever hear them talk about it. Sometimes I, I try to tell you guys both names they use, the one that we would recognize and the one in Israel, because if you go to Israel on one of the trips with us, you may miss when we pass by. Uh, like I did, some of them will use some of the ancient names, and you drive by, and they'll say, name some place that makes no sense to us. But um, if you ever hear the, your tour guide say Hatzor, that's Hazor, same place. 
Um, and when they uncovered the excavations, they found a lot of pagan worship there and, of course, a lot of uh, buildings that had been burned. So the evidence of Babylon coming in and burning them, even like it's talking about here in Jeremiah, we know now historically that's exactly what happened. Uh, they took everything away, all their valuables, their curtains, their camels, etc. Fear was on every side because they surrounded the city and closed them in. Verse 30, flee and get far away. Dwell in the depths, O inhabitants of Hazor, says the Lord. For Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has taken counsel against you and has conceived a plan against you. Arise and go up to the wealthy nation that dwells securely, says the Lord, which has neither gates nor bars, dwelling alone. Again, they, they thought they were safe. They thought they didn't need any greater fortification. Their camels shall be for booty or reward, their multitude of their cattle for plunder. I will scatter to all the winds those in the farthest corners, and I'll bring their calamity from all sides, says the Lord. Hazor shall be for a dwelling of jackals, a desolation forever. No one shall reside there, nor the Son of Man dwell in it. And no one lives there today. Um, I was there not that long ago. It's empty, other than ruins. And again, the animals, the wild animals dwell there, even as God said they would. So again, God's word is always accurate and true. Now the judgment on Elam, the region that's, um, again, in the um, Iran region today, kind of jumping around as he gives these different prophecies that he's sending to these nations. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam, in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the foremost of their might, and against Elam I'll bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven and, and scatter them toward all those winds. There shall be no nations where outcasts of Elam were not, will not go. So it's going to scatter again, we'd say, the ancient Iranians all over the, the, the region of the world at that time. For I'll cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies and before those who seek their life. I'll bring disaster upon them, my fierce anger, says the Lord, and I will send the sword after them until I've consumed them. And I will set my throne in Elam. That is not a throne as in blessing, but a throne of judgment. So he's talking about a judgment throne here. He's going to judge them. So I'll put my throne of judgment, if you will, in Elam, in Elam and I'll destroy them from there, their king, the princes, says the Lord. But, again, notice this. It shall come to pass in the latter days. Remember, latter days is always a signal that you're at the very end. Okay? In the latter days, I will bring back the captives of Elam, says the Lord. And again, uh, they're there today even as the Lord said. So we see modern day Iran uh, there in its borders, et cetera. So uh, chapter 49. Now I know I'm going through this rather quickly, but again, through these judgments, I'm kind of just reading through them because there's a lot of just uh, this repetitive kind of judgment that God's talking about on them. And I think just reading through it with not a huge amount of commentary other than what I see pertinent is probably the best way to travel through this uh, for our purposes. Chapter 50. Now he says the judgment on Babylon. The word of the Lord spoke against Babylon and against the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet. So Babylon, remember, they were used by God to judge everybody. He's going to say later, you're my hammer. You're the one I used to, to pound everybody, right? I did it, but I used you to do it. The problem is you thought it was you. You thought you were great. You thought you were mighty. No, it was me using you to do my work, and you went too far. You, you were too harsh with Israel. You did things that I didn't want you to do. And so now I'm going to judge you. So the one that was being used to judge others is now being judged. And that's what he goes into here. The word of the Lord that spoke against Babylon and against the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet. Declare among the nations, proclaim and set up a standard. That is a battle standard. Proclaim and do not conceal it. Say, Babylon is taken and Baal, which was their God, is shamed. Merodach, another God, is broken in pieces. Her idols are humiliated. Her images are broken in pieces. For out of the north, a nation comes against her, which shall make her land desolate, and no one shall dwell therein. They shall move, they shall depart, both man and beast. Again, we talked about the Medes and the Persians that came in after Babylon was destroyed, remember? And then, of course, Alexander the Great. You're seeing some of that history we've been covering in Daniel. He's talking about here prophetically. In those days and in that time, says the Lord, the children of Israel shall come, and, and they and the children of Judah together, with continual weeping, they shall come and seek the Lord their God. They shall ask the way to Zion. So when God judges Babylon, Israel's going to see their sin and come turning back to God and want to return back to the nation of Israel, which they did historically. With their faces toward it, that is toward to Zion, saying, come and let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that will not be forgotten. I love this. They turn their heart back after the judgment of God. We just want to serve God. We want to come back to our God and be his. What a great place this is for a heart to be in. Sometimes it takes a lot of rough places for us to get our heart back to that place, doesn't it? If you've been in that backslidden place, you know that. 
But what happened with Israel, they were so absorbed in all their false gods and all their false spirituality and teaching that God said, I'm gonna so burn that out of you, you'll never wanna do it again. So I'm gonna take you to Babylon, put you there for 70 years and let you have all the false idols that you want. Go ahead, go for it. Find find out how fulfilled you are by all that worldly stuff. And then when you come back to me empty, you're gonna be saying, I just wanna get back to where there was life. I wanna get back to where there was hope. I wanna get back to restoration. Look, some of you have been there. You came out of the world. You start walking with the Lord. And then the enemy pulled you back in the world. And you know what you found out when you went back in the world? It was just as empty, except even emptier this time because now you knew the Lord. So you're more miserable the second time than you were the first time. You know, I I oftentimes, I was thinking about it just again today. There's nothing the world has to offer to me. There's nothing. Now, again, God gives us, you know, I mean, sure, there's fun things. I'm not saying we can't have fun. But I mean, there's nothing to to leave the Lord and say, you know, I'm just going to go back to the world. I'm going to start partying. I'm going to live in the world, whatever. It was was empty and dead the first time. It took a few years to figure that out. But to go back to that and realize you're going back to to an empty well. There is nothing that God has put in this world that can satisfy anybody's heart in this room tonight. Nothing. And if you're pursuing some of those things right now, you know exactly what I'm saying because you're, you're saying right now, you're exactly right. I've been kind of chasing that and I'm empty. You know why? God didn't design the world to fulfill your heart. It just can't do it. I don't care how much fun is out there, how many trips to Disneyland, how many you know, things you buy or how many trips you take. You're gonna, you can have fun in those things if you're walking with the Lord and it's all in the proper order, okay? But if you're running to all that and saying, oh, I need to get filled up. I've got to, there's got to be more to life. And you go run, you're just going to stay empty and get emptier and emptier and emptier. It is God's design. And why did God do that? To make you realize finally how empty it is. So like the nation of Israel, you'd finally come back and say, look, I've had my feel of the world. I know how empty it is. I'm tired of it. I want to come back to something real. I want something that satisfies. I want something that lasts, that's eternal. And this is what happened to the nation of Israel. They came back with weeping and said, in a perpetual covenant, it will not be forgotten. We, we, want, we want you again, Lord. We're sorry. We realize the world has nothing to offer us. He says, my people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray. What a tragic line that is. What accountability pastors have But how sad it is when shepherds lead uh, God's people astray. I wouldn't want to be the man standing before the Lord on the day of accountability. I'm scared enough. I'm scared enough for you guys. I've got to give account for you guys. You know, when I I first started the ministry, I never thought about that that much. It's like, I'm calling me a pastor. I'm just going to go teach the word. And here we go, right? And the older I get, the more I realize, okay, that's good and all, Mark. You're doing what I called you to do. But realize one day you're going to be a give account for everybody in the church. I'm like, What? I mean, I know that's true, but so what does that exactly mean? I don't know, but it makes me a little bit afraid. It really does. It makes me a little bit afraid because I know my frailty. I know my weaknesses. I know the ways I've messed up with you guys. I know the things that maybe sometimes are right. You know, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a scary place to be. But again, if you're called to do it, God gives you the, you know, whatever you're called to do. Same thing for everybody. Whatever you're called to do, God will give you the grace to do. But I think about a shepherd leading. Again, if, they, if you purposely lead God's people astray, God's gonna really be upset about that. Not a good thing. He says, they've turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from the mountain to the hill. They've forgotten their resting place. So just kind of letting them wander and not giving them any real direction. And all who found them have devoured them. And their adversary said, we've not offended because they have sinned against the Lord, the habitation of justice, the Lord, the hope of their fathers. He says, move from the midst of Babylon, get out of the land of the Chaldeans and be like the rams before the flocks. In other words, get out of the world would be a modern way of saying that. Although this is a literal application to real Babylon, He says, for behold, I will raise and cause to come up against Babylon an assembly of great nations from the north country, and they shall array themselves against her, for there she shall be captured. So I'm going to judge the world, so get out of it. That's a modern application. I'm going to judge Babylon, get out of Babylon before I judge it. I'm going to judge the world, get out of it before I judge. You know, we read in Revelation, Mystery of Babylon, it's a picture of the world. And so there's still mystery of Babylon going on right now. It's, it's the world. And God says, get out of the world. I'm going to judge them for what they're doing because the world still, they won't repent. They won't turn to me. Well, don't you be judged with them. Get away from them. Be separate from them. Now, look, we have to go in the world or we can't reach the lost, right? We have to share our faith. We have to befriend the unsaved. We have to reach out to them. However, it, you're not to become their hangout buddy. Living your life with those that don't know God. Light and darkness can't have true fellowship. They naturally repel each other. And if you're comfortable hanging out with unbelievers all the time, you're probably not being light. 
Because light and darkness repel each other. Now, again, I'm not saying you don't get among unbelievers. You need to be among them. Get among them. We've got to go among the lost to reach them, okay? But there's a difference in living among them. Try, I mean, there's a difference in being among them and trying to reach them and be a witness to them and just deciding these are my hangout buddies for life. That's a dangerous place. If, if, there's, if there's a comfort zone in being, living your life with unbelievers, then we need to do a heart check, you know, what's going on? We have to, you know, are we really just a part of Babylon or are we separate from Babylon? That's why the Lord said, come out from among them and, and, and don't be among them. I don't, you know, there you're going to be captured. I don't want to judge you as well or you be in the midst of their judgment and suffer the consequences, okay? You're going to, you would be saved, but you'd suffer the consequences of the judgment among them. He says, their arrows shall be like those of an expert warrior. None shall escape in vain. That's what God judged them. And Chaldea shall become plunder. All who plunder her shall be satisfied, says the Lord. So they're going to they're gonna wipe them out. Here's why. Because, now this member, they were the hammer. They were the ones judging everyone else. Now here's why God's going to judge them. He says, because you were glad and because you rejoiced, you destroyers of my heritage. That is Israel. He calls Israel his heritage. Because you've grown fat like a heifer threshing grain and you bellow like bulls. You had everything you wanted, all the reward you had, but you were mean to my people. I wanted them to be judged, but I didn't want you to abuse them and take advantage of that. Because of that, I'm going to judge you now because you didn't love the nation of Israel. Kind of a warning for us today as well, I believe. Your mother shall be deeply ashamed. She who bore you shall be ashamed. Behold, the least of the nations shall be a wilderness, a dry land and a desert. Because of the wrath of the Lord, she shall not be inhabited, but she shall be wholly desolate. Everyone who goes, goes to Babylon shall be horrified and hiss at all her plagues. Put yourselves in array against Babylon all around, all you who bend the bow. Shoot at her, the Lord. Take vengeance on her as she has done so due to her. So notice this, she did it and now her payment's coming back. Cut off the sower from Babylon and him who handles the sickle at harvest time. For fear of the oppressing sword, everyone shall turn to his own people and everyone shall flee to his own land. Israel's like scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. Now this is the result of what Babylon did to them. First, the king of Assyria devoured him. Now at last, this Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has broken his bones. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will punish the king of Babylon and his land as I've punished the king of Assyria and I'll bring back Israel to his home and he shall feed on Carmel, that's the mountains up north, and Bashan, that's in the Golan area today. His soul shall be satisfied on Mount Ephraim and Gilead, again, northern Israel, and that's what happened. God brought the Jews back into the land and they resettled the land and they're there today, still yet. He says, in those days and in that time, says the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought. Now, now again, but there shall be none found. That is when God brings them back and restores them because they're going to be repentant. And the sins of Judah, but they shall not be found for I will pardon those whom I preserve. That is, they're going to be repentant and I'm going to forgive them and so I'm going to restore them. A great encouragement to Israel here. Go up against the land of Merathaim, against it, against the inhabitants of Pekod, waste and utterly destroy them, says the Lord, and do according to all that I've commanded you. Again, areas of Babylon. A sound of battle was in the land and great destruction. Here it is, how the hammer of the whole earth, what a, what a statement that is, how the hammer of the whole earth, that is Nebuchadnezzar, uh, you know, Babylon, has been cut apart and broken. How Babylon has become a desolation among the nations. You know, America could almost be referred to in, in, up until this point kind of as the hammer of the whole earth. You know, whenever there's been something that's happened worldwide that needed to be dealt with, who dealt with it? It's America. The problem is, I don't think we're in the place to do that anymore. So here's the question. Who's going to do that from this point on? Well, the Lord's always the one that does it through whoever he's going to do it for. But one of the reasons I believe we're coming toward the return of the Lord, and I believe we're living in those days at some point around this season, if you will, for the Lord to come back, is God is not in our generation. There's, there's typically a, a, a nation preserved that God uses as his hammer to keep the, the earth in order. We don't have that anymore. Our hammer's been broken. I mean, we, you, you might still think, yeah, but we still have the mighty military. We still have the, listen, guys, I don't, think we really, I don't think we're gonna know how weak we are until somebody moves on us. I think about Samson. Samson was able to get up under the power of God and do all these amazing things, all these amazing things. And then Samson turned away from his source of power. He, he, he turned from God. He, he broke his covenant. God, he, he cut his hair 
which was the covenant that was made by himself and his family to God that God said, I'll work in that. In a sense, the picture is he broke his covenant with God. And once he broke his covenant with God, then the Philistines came upon him and it says he got up to go out as before and did not know that the Lord was not with him. I fear that for our nation. We've had the Lord with us. Whether or not the whole nation loved God or didn't, we had enough believers and enough honor of God in our nation until this last generation to where God was able to use us. Look, when, when, when Iraq moved against Israel, when anybody, started, anybody that attacks Israel, God always deals with them. And the last major assault was, you know, uh, Iraq attacking Israel and all the Scud missiles, and you saw it in the Saddam Hussein and all that. No matter what you think about war or this or that, God raised up America and put a stop to it. Within 100 days, this thing was shut down. And God used America to shut it down. By the way, if you remember, maybe you didn't even know, there were 39 Scud missiles shot into Israel from Iraq when God did that. 39. Not one person was killed by a missile. And many of them landed like in Tel Aviv. If you were, it's like highly populated building upon building upon building. Now, there were a couple of deaths. They were by heart attacks. People got afraid. Some older people, when the, when the bombs went off, it scared them and they died of a heart attack. But nobody got killed by an actual Scud missile coming in. I find it interesting because when that happened, the thing that immediately struck me was the way that God would chastise the disobedient in Israel in that day, the way that they would do it in the synagogue, is they bring them in the synagogue and they didn't lash them the way that Jesus was lashed, you know, like with the whip of cat of nine tails and all the, the metal and the, and the bone and things that would rip the skin off. It wasn't that. It was just leather straps and they were not beaten nearly as hard as the Roman soldiers would have done. It was more of a kind of a that hurts and it's humiliating type event. Yes, it hurt, but it was humiliating because you were kind of in front of your community shamed getting this public whipping at church. I mean, imagine this. If we did that today, you come to church and you get a whipping in front of everybody. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty humiliating, isn't it, right? But guess how many, when you're in rebellion to God, guess how many lashes they, they, God limited to, that, how many they, they gave them? 39. 39 lashes. Do you find it interesting that God gave 39 lashes on the nation of Israel from Saddam Hussein's scud missiles, saying, you've rebelled against me, I'm going to publicly chastise you and shame you. Nobody will die. This is not a chastisement unto death. This is not a scourging like Jesus took. But I'm going to humiliate you and show that, you know what, if I allow people to come in and chastise you, I can allow the nations around you. I'm protecting you, but I can allow you to have a spanking. And after your 39 lashes are done, I'll raise the nation up that I've ordained to stop it. America, they'll come in, they'll wipe out Saddam, they'll shut the whole thing down, my hammer of all the earth, if you will, and I'll deal with it. Well, here's what's interesting to me. The Bible says in the last days, Israel will have nobody to rely on but God. He'll be the hammer of the whole earth. There's not going to be a nation that will defend them. And anymore right now, our current administration, this is not political, guys. This is just a fact, okay? Our current administration is anti-Israel. And if you don't know that, you hadn't read what they said, what they're doing, and don't really know what's going on behind the scenes. It's a very anti-Israel position America has taken through our leadership right now, which is something you don't really like in relation to God and how God deals with nations that do that. But my point is this. There's not a nation now to come to Israel's rescue. And that's why when Iran and Russia come in to attack Israel, guess who's going to step up and say, I don't think so. It's not going to be America. It's not going to be China, Russia, anybody else. The Lord says, my nostrils will flare on my face. And my anger will come up in my face. And I will judge those nations coming against my people. I mean, that's, again, God says, I'll do it. I'll protect you. It's interesting, on Sunday, we're going to be looking at um, this last chapter of Daniel. God talks about the protector of Israel, the watcher of Israel, Michael the archangel. And somebody was saying to me, are you worried about Israel? There's some, a few little bombs going off in the north and the south. That's always, almost always going on over there, guys. I don't know. It's just there's always little skirmishes. There have been since they've been back in 40 years. It doesn't worry me at all. And I'll tell you what. When you're in the land of Israel, you feel so safe. It's almost like you can feel yourself surrounded by the power of God. And number one, I know it is the power of God, but there's also the presence of this mighty archangel, Michael. That's his job. You watch over Israel. Yes, sir. I can't wait to see Michael. I know I'll talk about him a lot, but. <laughs> I mean, that's, Michael's the, the, is the one I just, it, it, amazing, amazing, amazing guy. Um, but again, you know, God right now, you know, uh, Michael will be the hammer. God's gonna be the hammer. He's gonna be the one protecting Israel. And so it used to be, uh, uh, you know, America. Here it used to be uh, Babylon. But things have changed. Verse 24, I've laid a snare for you. You have indeed been trapped, O Babylon, and you who are not aware, you have been found and also caught because you contended against the Lord. Not a good thing. The Lord has opened his armory. 
He's brought up the weapons of his indignation, for this is the work of the Lord of hosts, or the Lord of battle, I love it, in the land of the Chaldeans. Come against her from the farthest border, open her storehouses, cast her up as a heap of ruins, and destroy her utterly. Let a nothing of her be left. Slay all her bulls, let them go down to slaughter. Woe to them, for their day has come, the time of their punishment. The voice of those who flee and escape from the land of Babylon declares in Zion the vengeance of the Lord our God, the vengeance of his temple. Call together the archers against Babylon, all who bend the bow and camp against it all around. Let none of them escape. Repay her according to her work, according to all she's done uh, due to her, for she's been proud against the Lord, against the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, her young men shall fall on the streets, and all her men of war shall be cut off in that day, says the Lord. Behold, I am against you, O most haughty one, says the Lord of hosts, for your day has come. Whoa. The time that I will punish you. The most proud shall stumble and fall, and no one shall raise him up. I will kindle a fire in his cities, and I will devour all around him. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the children of Israel were oppressed along with the children of Judah, and all who took them captive have held them fast. They have refused to let them go. But look at this. Their redeemer is strong. Who's our redeemer? It's the Lord, Jesus. He's the redeemer, the Bible says. Their redeemer is strong. The Lord of hosts is his name. Jesus is the Lord of hosts, in other words. And by the way, note the Lord there is all capital, which means Yahweh. So this is calling us right here, who? Yahweh. Yahweh. He will thoroughly plead their case that he may give rest to the land and disquiet the inhabitants of Babylon. A sword is against the Chaldeans, says Yahweh, the Lord, against the inhabitants of Babylon and against all her princes and her wise men. A sword is against the soothsayers, they will be fools. A sword is against her mighty men, they'll be dismayed. A sword is against their horses, that is their strength in military, against their chariots, their tanks, we'd say, against all the mixed peoples who are in the midst, and they'll become like women. A sword is against their treasuries, and they shall be robbed. Again, he's saying, look, none of these things that they're depending on are going to help them because God is mighty in judgment. A drought is against her waters, and they'll be dried up. For it is the land of carved images, and they're insane with their idols, their false worship. Therefore, the wild desert beast shall dwell there with the jackals, and the ostriches shall dwell in it, so inhabited just by animals. It shall be inhabited no more forever, nor shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. As God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighbors, says the Lord, so shall no one reside there, nor the Son of Man dwell in it. Behold, a people shall come from the north, a great nation, and many kings shall be raised up from the ends of the earth. And they shall hold the bow and the lance, and they are cruel, and they shall not show mercy. Their voice shall roar like the sea. They shall ride on horses, set in array like a man for the battle against you, O daughter of Babylon." King of Babylon has heard the report about them, and his hands grow feeble. Anguish has taken hold of him, pangs of a woman in childbirth. There's that whole analogy again, of the woman in childbirth. Behold, he shall come up like a lion from the flood plain of the Jordan. There's again that surprise that the animals are forced upon you suddenly against their dwelling places of the strong, but I'll make them suddenly run away from her. And who is, who is a chosen man that I may appoint over her? And who is like me? Who will arraign me? And who is that shepherd who will withstand me? Unless he see, repeats this again. Therefore, hear the counsel of the Lord that he has taken against Babylon. His purpose is that he has purposed against the land of the Chaldeans. Surely the least of the flock shall draw them out. Surely he will make their dwelling place desolate with them. At the noise of the taking of Babylon, the earth trembles and a cry is heard among the nations. So again, repeating some of the same phraseologies and judgments that he brought against them. And he goes on about the destruction of Babylon in chapter 51. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up against Babylon, against those who dwell in leb a, a destroying wind. And I'll send winnowers to Babylon. Remember the winnower? They would go to where the wheat was and you would crush the wheat with something heavy, break the heads of grain out of it, and then you'd get in a windy place and throw the wheat up in the air and the chaff, which is the part that didn't have the grain, would blow away and the grain would fall to the ground. So by the time you were done on a good windy day, you'd have a nice little pile of wheat with all the hay laying over to the side. He says, that's what I'm gonna do to Babylon. You're gonna be winnowed. You're gonna be blown away in the wind and winnowed, and who shall winnow her and empty her land? For in the day of doom they shall be against her all around. Against her let the archer bend his bow and lift himself up against her in his armor. Do not spare her young men, utterly destroy all her army. Thus the slain shall fall in the land of the Chaldeans, and those thrust, thrust through in her streets. For Israel's not forsaken, nor Judah by his God, the Lord of hosts. Their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel. Flee from the midst of Babylon, everyone save his life, 
And do not be cut off in her iniquity. There's the warning again. Get away from the world. For this is the time of the Lord's vengeance, and he shall recompense her. Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand. So he used them. He was going to use them in a great way. They made all the earth drink. God was using them for his judgments. The nations drank her wine. Therefore, the nations are deranged. And that's a picture of, you know, the cup to drink is a picture of judgment. But they're deranged because of this drink. Babylon is because now they become drunk on their own power, I guess you would say. Babylon has suddenly fallen and been destroyed. Well for her. Take balm or medicine, we would say, for her pain. Perhaps she may be healed, you know? Maybe she'll repent. We would have healed Babylon, but she's not healed. It's because she didn't repent, in other words. Forsake her. Let us go, everyone, to his own country, for her judgment reaches to heaven and is lifted up to the skies. The Lord has revealed our righteousness. Come, let us declare in Zion the work of the Lord our God. Make the arrows bright. Gather the shields. You can look at these pictures of battle. The Lord has raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes. And we talked about, again, Medes and Persians coming in to take them when they were conquered. His plan is against Babylon to destroy it. But it is, it is the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance for his temple. Remember, Babylon not only destroyed Israel, they destroyed the temple. Set up a standard on the walls of Babylon. Make the guards strong. Set up a watchman. Prepare the ambushes. For the Lord has both devised and done what he has spoken against the inhabitants of Babylon. O oh, you who dwell by many waters, abundant in treasures, where you have the Tigris, Tigris and Euphrates there. Um, your end has come, the measure of your covetousness. The Lord of hosts has sworn by himself, surely I will fill you with men as with locusts, that is, armies. And they shall lift up a shout against you. He has made the earth by his power. He has established the world by his wisdom and stretched out the heaven by his understanding. When he utters his voice, there's a multitude of waters in the heavens. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightnings for rain. He brings the wind out of his treasuries. Again, just look at the power of God's creation and God. Everyone is dull-hearted without knowledge. Every metalsmith, that is those making these false gods, is put to shame by the carved image. For his molded image is falsehood. And there's no breath in them. They're futile, a work of errors. In the time of their punishment, they shall perish. The portion of Jacob is not like them. It's different for his, for he is the maker of all things and Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. Notice this, the Lord of hosts or Yahweh of hosts is his name. Remember it says in Colossians chapter one, who's the maker of all things? Jesus Christ. It says in Colossians one that Jesus created all things that exist. And so now we see him, Jesus here being spoken of as Yahweh. Remember they're one and the same. As what Jesus said to Philip, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now we see Yahweh here. He says the, the, his maker, the maker of all things is Yahweh of hosts. Jesus is the maker of all things. So again, the mystery of the Trinity, but just the power and the exaltation of who Jesus really is. He's Again, all through the scriptures, it's interesting. Uh, the, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees were trying to follow the law. And as they tried to follow the law, they thought they had everything down, all their wisdom. And the Lord said, you search the law daily thinking that you're finding God. He said, but it's those, it, they, it speaks of me. I'm in there. I'm everywhere in the Bible. It's all about me. And even here, we're reading Jesus, if you will. He goes on talking about what Babylon was. You're my battle ax and a weapon of war. But notice who was doing it. Again, they were, the, they were the weapon, but who was doing it? He says, for with you, I will break the nation in pieces. With you, Babylon, that is, I'll destroy kingdoms. With you, I break in pieces the horse and its rider. With you, I break in pieces the chariot and its rider. With you, also, I break in pieces man and woman. With you, I break in pieces old and young. With you, I break in pieces the young man and the maiden. With you, also, I break in pieces the shepherd and his flock. With you, I will break in pieces the farmer and his yoke of oxen. With you, I will break in pieces governors and rulers. And I will repay Babylon and all the inhabitants of Chaldea for all the evil they've done in Zion in your sight, says the Lord. Behold, I'm against you, O destroying mountain. You don't want to hear God say that. Who destroys all the earth, says the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against you and roll you down from the rocks. I mean, that's pretty graphic. I'll make you a burnt mountain. They shall not take from you a stone for a corner, nor a stone for a foundation. You'll be so wiped out, none of your stones will even be good to rebuild with. But you shall be a desolate forever, says the Lord. Set up a banner in the land. Again, this is a battle banner, a standard. Blow the trumpet among the nations, a, a, a trumpet for battle. Prepare the nations against her. Call the kingdoms against her. Ararat, Mini, Ashkenaz, appoint a general against her. Cause the horses to come up like bristling locusts. <laughs> 
Prepare against her the nations with the kings of the Medes, its governors and all its rulers, all the land of his dominion. Again, the Medes again destroyed them. And the land will tremble and sorrow for every purpose of the Lord shall be performed against Babylon to make the land of Babylon a desolation without inhabitant. The mighty men of Babylon have ceased fighting. They've remained in their strongholds. Their might has failed. They have become like women. They have burned her dwelling places. The bars and her gate are broken. One runner will run to meet another, one messenger to meet another that is giving the message back and forth about what's happening in the battle to show the king of Babylon that his city is taken on all sides. The passages are blocked. The reeds have been burned with fire. The men of war are terrified. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, the daughter of Babylon is like a threshing floor. Again, that the wheat is separated from, the, from the, uh, um, the chaff. When it's time to thresh her, yet a little while, and the time of her harvest will come. That's judgment. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has devoured me. He has crushed me. He has made me an empty vessel. He has swallowed me up like a monster. He has filled his stomach with my delicacies. He has spit me out. Let the violence be done to me. My, uh, let the violence done to me and my flesh be upon Babylon. This is like Israel speaking here, if you will. The inhabitants of Zion will say, and my blood be upon the inhabitants of Chaldea. Jerusalem will say. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will plead your case and take vengeance for you. I will dry up her sea and make her springs dry. God speaking judgment against Babylon for Israel's sake. Babylon shall become a heap, a dwelling place for jackals, an astonishment and a hissing without an inhabitant. They shall roar together like lions. They shall growl like lions whelps, you know, the young ones. In their excitement, I will prepare their feasts. I will make them drunk that they may rejoice and sleep a perpetual sleep. So I'm gonna wipe them out. And they won't awake, says the Lord. I will bring them down like lambs to the slaughter, like rams with male goats. Oh, how Shishak is taken. That's another name for Babylon. Oh, how the praise of the whole earth is seized. Again, they were at that time the leader of the world. How Babylon has become desolate among the nations. The sea has come up over Babylon. That is a sea of peoples, a sea of armies. She is covered with a multitude of its waves. Her cities are a desolation, a dry land and a wilderness, a land where no one dwells, uh, through which no man uh, passes. I will punish Baal, the god, if you will, of Babylon, in Babylon. I'll bring out of his mouth what he has swallowed, and the nations shall not uh, stream to him anymore. Yes, the wall of Babylon shall fail. My people shall fall. My people go out of the midst of her. Here's that warning again. I'm going to do this. Get out of her. Now, he was speaking straight to the people there that were in Babylon at that time, the Jews that had not gone back to Israel yet. But again, there's an application for us today, this whole picture of still Babylon in the last days, mystery Babylon. My people, God would say to us tonight, get out of the world. Get away from the world. You have no business in the world. Get out of the world. Go into the world to reach the lost, but get away and don't be a part of their judgment. Don't, don't partake in their sin. And let everyone deliver himself from the fierce anger of the Lord. And lest your heart faint and you fear for the rumor that will be heard in the land. A rumor will come one year and after that another. A rumor will come and violence in the land. Ruler against ruler. I think this may be a dual prophecy speaking about where Jesus said in the last days there'll be wars and rumors of war. And again, we see Babylon as a picture of the, the, the earth in the last days and all the nations. So he says, you're going to hear a rumor this one year, another rumor, hey, so-and-so, China's going to attack Taiwan. Oh, no, they're going to do this. Okay, there's going to be a war there. All these rumors, some things will happen, some won't. Therefore, behold, the days are coming that I'll bring judgment on the carved images of Babylon. Her whole land shall be ashamed, and her slain shall fall in her midst. Then the heavens and the earth and all that is in them shall sing joyously over Babylon. For the plunderer shall come to her from the north, says the Lord. As Babylon has caused the slain of Israel to fall, so at Babylon the slain of all the earth shall fall. You who have escaped the sword, get away. Do not stand still. You know, if you've gotten out of there, then keep going. Remember the Lord afar off, and let Jerusalem come to your mind. We are ashamed because we've heard reproach. Shame has covered our faces, for strangers have come into the sanctuaries of the Lord's house. So we've seen the judgment. It was our fault, he's saying, uh, that Israel's fault, that they were judged. So they're ashamed of it. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I'll bring judgment on her carved images, and throughout all her land uh, the wounded shall groan. Though Babylon were to mount up to heaven, and though she were to fortify the height of her strength, yet for me plunderers would come to her, says the Lord. The sound of a cry comes from Babylon, and great destruction from the land of the Chaldeans, because the Lord is plundering Babylon and silencing her loud voice. Uh, th though her waves roar like great waters and the noise of her voice is uttered because the plunderer comes against her, against Babylon, and her mighty men are taken. Every one of the bows is broken for the Lord is the Lord God of recompense. He will surely repay. 
And I will make drunk her princes and her wise men, her governors, her deputies, and her mighty men, and they shall sleep a perpetual sleep. Again, the same language, you're wiped out for good. And not awake, says the Lord, whose name is the Lord of hosts. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the broad walls of Babylon, remember how huge they were. You could do six chariot races across the top of the walls of Babylon, they said. Six chariots side by side could do races. On the wall of Babylon. Shows you how thick it was. He said, so the broad walls of Babylon shall be utterly broken. And her high gates, they say, I think were as high as 300 feet high. Her high gates shall be burned with fire. The people will labor in vain and the nations because of the fire and they shall be weary. The word which came to Jeremiah the prophet commanded Sariah, the son of Neriah, the son of Messiah, uh, when he went with Zedekiah, the king of Judah to Babylon in the fourth year of his reign. And Sariah was the quartermaster. So Jeremiah wrote, Jeremiah rather wrote in a book all the evil that would come upon Babylon, all the words that are written against Babylon. And Jeremiah said to Sariah, when you arrive in Babylon see uh, and see it and read all these words, then you, you shall say, O Lord, you have spoken against this place and cut it off so that none shall remain in it, neither man nor beast, but it shall be a desolate forever. And it shall be when you finish the reading of this book that you shall tie a stone to it and throw it in the Euphrates Then you shall say, thus Babylon shall sink and not rise from the catastrophe that I will bring upon her, and they shall be weary. Thus far are the words of Jeremiah. This is interesting because in Revelation, we see the same thing. God judges mystery Babylon, the the Babylon of the last days, and tells the angel to throw it like a stone into the waters where it sinks to the bottom. So there's a lot of imagery of the first Babylon and then this last world system Babylon that we see. And... um, just a few verses here, 34, we're going to do. We're going to finish the chapter. We're going to finish the whole thing tonight, or the, the book. So hang in there with me. We have time. Uh, we'll come back next week. We only have one chapter, and, and I want to start the book of Lamentations next time. So um, he wraps it up here. Look, chapter 52, Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. He also did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim had done. For because of the anger of the Lord, this happened in Jerusalem and Judah, till he finally cast them out from his presence. And Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. It came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, on the tenth month of the tenth day of the month, that was January 15th, the Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon and all his army came against Jerusalem and encamped against it. And they built a siege wall against it all around. So the city was besieged until the 11th year of King Zedekiah by the fourth month on the ninth day. That's that's July 18th this year. So January 15th then. It'll be July 18th this year. I'm not sure what it was uh, then. Uh, I should have glanced on what it was then, but I was looking at what it was today to tell you guys, but that probably was a different day then. But either way, two years and five months after it was under siege, they fell. Um, on the ninth day of the month, a famine had become so severe in the city, there was no food for the people of the land. So they starved them out, which they would do in these sieges. Babylon did to Israel. And the city wall was broken through and all the men of war fled and went out of the city by night uh, by the way of the gate between the two walls. That's down in the city of David at the very bottom of the city of David where the Gihon Springs, they had two walls down there. And it was a place that you could go and escape and get down through the valley, right down there where kind of the Kidron Valley and the ben Hinnom Valley came together and you could flee down toward Jericho that way. So they snuck out to go that way, which is by the King's Garden, even though the Chaldeans were near the city all around and they went by the way of the plain. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and they overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho And all his army was scattered from him. So they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah in the land of Hamath, and he pronounced judgment on him. And the king of Babylon killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, and then he killed all the princes of Judah in Riblah. He also put out the eyes of Zedekiah. We talked about this, how cruel it was. He killed Zedekiah's kids in front of him. So that would be the last thing he ever saw. And then he poked out Zedekiah's eyes. And the king of Babylon, and this is so, it was so avoidable. If Zedekiah had just repented, guys, here's the warning again. I can't go too long on this. We have to finish up tonight. But if we just would repent when God warns us, we don't have to face all the consequences that we face. If there's something you're doing tonight you need to repent of, hear the plea of the Lord. Hear the Spirit speaking. Repent of it. Don't, Don't have to have your eyes poked out, so to speak, in whatever that consequence is. God's warning you now. It doesn't have to happen. But it will happen if you don't repent. And the king of Babylon bound him in bronze fetters, bronze the medal of judgment, took him to Babylon and put him in prison until the day of his death. So he stayed bound in prison until he died because of his rebellion to God. How sad. 
Under the fifth month of the tenth day of the month, which was the nineteenth year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard who served the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He burned the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem, that is all the houses of the great. You can see those burnt houses in Jerusalem today. Again, uh, we've seen them multiple times. He burned them with fire and all the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down the walls of Jerusalem all around. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, carried captive of the poor people, some of them. The rest of the people remained in the city, the defectors who had deserted the king of Babylon and the rest of the craftsmen. But Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, left some of the poor of the land as vine dressers and farmers. So the poor got uh, blessed in this situation. God had mercy on them. And some of them were able to stay and remain in the land uh, that hadn't rebelled with the city, if you will. The bronze pillars that were in the house. Now, this is this last part. I'm just going to read this again straight through. It's so sad because you have this passion of Jeremiah pouring out his heart about the judgment and the weeping prophet, right? And now as we read through these last verses, it's almost like a man with a clipboard writing down all the consequences. Here's what happened because they refused to repent. Instead of the weeping prophet, you have almost like the the administrator writing down the damage and the lack of repentance. And that's what it's like for God. He weeps for us. And then there comes the day of judgment. And it's just a matter of here's the consequences now that we have to face one after another. And so there's this kind of drone to this that kind of leaves the emotion of Jeremiah and goes to this kind of just like you're before a judge in court. And the judge is reading, now here's what your judgment is. Boom, 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 boom. 17, the bronze pillars that were in the house of the Lord, the carts of the bronze sea that were in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans broke in pieces, carried all the bronze to Babylon. They also took away the pots, the shovels, the trimmers, the bowls, the spoons, and all the bronze utensils which the priests ministered, the basins, the fire pans, the bowls, the pots, the lampstands, the spoons, the cups, whatever was solid gold and whatever was solid silver, the captain of the guard took away. The two pillars... One sea, the 12 bronze bulls, which were under it, the carts, this, all the things that are on the temple mount, which King Solomon had made for the house of the Lord, the bronze and all these articles, measure beyond measure. Again, just the sadness of everything being taken away because of their rebellion to God. Now concerning the pillars, the height of one pillar was 18 cubits. Look how sterile this is. A measuring line of 12 cubits could measure its circum- circumference. Its thickness was four fingers. It was hollow. A capital of bronze was on it, and the height of one capital was five cubits with a network of pomegranates all around the capital, all of bronze. The second pillar with pomegranates was the same. There were uh, 96 pomegranates on the sides, and all the pomegranates all around the network were 100. The captain of the guard took Saraya, the chief priest, Sephani, the second priest, and the, th- and the three doorkeepers. He also took out the, of the city an officer who had charge of the men of war, seven men of the king's close associates who were found in the city, the principal scribe of the army who mustered the people of the land, the 60 men of the people of the land who were found in the midst of the city, and Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, took these and brought them to the king of Babylon at Riblah, and the king of Babylon struck them and put them to death at Ribna in the land of Hamath. Again, all could have been avoided. Thus Judah was carried away captive from its own land. It's like, there's the finishing. You're done. They were done because of their rebellion. These are the people of Nebuchadnezzar carried away captive. In the seventh year, 3,023 Jews. In the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar, he carried away captive from Jerusalem, 832 persons. In the 23rd year of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, carried away captives of the Jews, 745 persons. All the persons were 4,600. And it came to pass in the 37th year of the captivity of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 12th day of the month, that evil Merodach, that was kind of a, just kind of a title. It's kind of a funny title to us today, but not that he was evil, but that was his title. King of Babylon, in the first year of his reign, lifted up the head of Jehoiachin. Remember, this is the one that reigned for only three months. He was so wicked, God removed him. He raised up his head from prison, king of Judah, and brought him out of prison. And he spoke kindly to him and gave him a more prominent seat than those of the kings who were with him in Babylon. It would appear that Jehoiachin repented. Now, it doesn't tell us. But it would appear that he repented. God gave him favor. God moved in the hearts of the leaders to raise him up out of prison. What a reversal this is. Zedekiah, if he'd have repented, wouldn't have been in prison. Now he's in prison until he dies. Jehoiachin, who did something so bad, God removed him after three months, would appear to have repented. It was, I think it's implied in the, in, the, in the story here. And he gets brought out of prison. Again, this, this sign of repentance, where the king brings you out of prison when you repent and seats you among princes. So Jehoiachin changed from his prison garments. That's what we do when we come to Christ. And he ate bread regularly before the king all the days of his life. That's what we do with Jesus, eating the bread of life. And as for his provisions, there was a regular ration given him by the king of Babylon, a portion for each day until the day of his death, all the days of his life. And we finished the book of Jeremiah. 
Thank you for hanging in there with me, guys. I know, I know I pushed this, I know I did, but you know what, I, the one chapter coming back wouldn't have, been, wouldn't have been what I wanted to do, so I know it took us longer, you guys are very patient, I normally don't do this to you that long, but you were very, very gracious, but guys, note this, what a beautiful way to end that book. All the judgment, all the destruction, all that happened, and at the end, this one guy who was living in sin so bad that God took him out after three months, all of a sudden we see that God gives him favor, they bring him out of prison, they give him prince's garments, he eats of the king's provision and bread daily, and he gets a portion of the Lord's bread every day for the rest of his life. That is the description of the believer. The person who repents of his sin comes out of the prison of sin. You're forgiven. You sit at the king's table and you're given a daily provision of the manna, the word of God, as God takes care of us each and every day and pours out his blessing. And those of us who should be in prison and be judged, we are sitting at the king's table. We are a blessed people. Are we a blessed people? Hallelujah. So, Lord, thank you, God, that you've taken us, Lord, from the prison house. You've taken our prison clothes off. You put garments of praise on us. You've seated us at the table of the king and called us princes and kings unto you and priests even unto you. And, Lord, you've given us the, the, the portion of the king's table, but you've given us our daily portion of bread. Lord, your word of God, as we read it every morning, you are faithful to give us our portion and to nourish us and to grow us and to strengthen us. And Lord, how we can't wait to be in the true kingdom with our God seated at your table and giving you all praise and glory. So Father, we bless you tonight and thank you for the work you've done by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, pour out your spirit on your people. Lord, bless your precious flock tonight. Look at your sheep. Look at them, Lord. There they are. They could have done anything else tonight, but they came here because they love you. And they sat in your field and grazed, Lord, among your flock as you fed them your word. Bless them for it. Lord, just overwhelm them right now with your Holy Spirit. Pour it out on your people and fill them with joy. Let them leave here rejoicing and just 